Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I have an RGB to HDMI that's not working properly, so I'm gonna try to repair it. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So I've talked about it many times, how much I love the RGB to HDMI. I really feel that this is one of the best things to come along for retro computers in a while, at least when it comes to using retro computers with modern displays. I'm really lucky down in the basement here to have a really good selection of good CRTs to use with these vintage computers. But sometimes I don't feel like getting out a very big heavy CRT just to use really quickly when I'm using like my test bench, which is sitting right here. So that's where the RGB to HDMI comes in so handy because you could just use any old monitor. You could even use a VGA monitor if you have one with a HDMI to VGA adapter on this thing to get a really good pixel perfect image from whatever retro computer you're using. Now this is the RGB to HDMI that I keep on my bench generally, and I got this one from Aaron over at Retro Hack Shack, and he actually sent me the little case that this is in as well. Just in case this is the first time you're hearing about this particular project, what this is is a Raspberry Pi Zero down here on the bottom connected to this top board, which has a CPLD on it, which does the digitization of the digital signal, in this case at least, and then the Raspberry Pi on the bottom is what does the heavy lifting to convert those signals into an appropriate pixel-perfect HDMI output. Now this is the CPLD right here on the top board. There's not a lot going on, there's just four buttons, and there is a connector on the bottom, which I have this nine pin on. So this is set up for digital TTL input, which means CGA, EGA, and monochrome, along with any other system that might use a digital signal, like say the output from a Macintosh. And I have a video where I took an RGB to HDMI and I connected it to a Macintosh Classic and got a nice pixel perfect HDMI output from that machine. Now, if you're a regular viewer of my channel, you'll see that this thing makes an appearance often on the channel. I think the most recent time I used it was for the Commodore Pet Repair Series, and this plugs into the user port, and then it has the standard 9-pin connector here, which connects to that. Well, I need to use a cable because they're both female there. And there is an appropriate profile on here, which I created and I shared with the creator or maintainer of the project. So that is now included with the release. So you can use your PET 4016 or 4032 with the RGB to HDMI to get a pixel perfect display. I also have another RGB to HDMI here. And this one looks a little bit different because this has this 25 pin connector on it. The reason for this is that this is designed to connect up to an Apple IIgs directly to the motherboard, I might add, to give you pixel perfect output on the Apple IIgs as well. And this is completely a digital signal. It's picking it up before the signals go into the DAC. So you're getting a pixel perfect representation of the Apple IIgs image on HDMI with this very inexpensive device. I'll have some more videos for the RGB to HDMI showing off how cool it is. But what this video is about is doing a repair on the RGB to HDMI itself. So this right here is another CPLD board. And this one I had been using on this Pi here for quite a while. And I can tell them apart because uh, this has a, a red and a blue button there and this has all black buttons. I was using this CPLD board in combination with this cable here, hooked up to a PC to try to display a monochrome display and I was getting no picture. It was strange to me because I know I had used this board with CGA like just a little while before and it worked fine, but it wasn't displaying anything with monochrome. I just assumed I had something wrong with my cable or maybe the video card in the PC was bad, so I just moved on to a different card. But upon further investigation, it turned out that this CPLD board is bad. Over here on the GitHub repo for the RGB to HDMI, and I'm looking at one of the forks here from ENSB. This is actually a bit more of an up-to-date repository of all the code that does eventually get merged back into the original uh, Hoglet 67 one, but I recommend using this one. I'll have a link in the description if you're gonna download any of the most recent software to run on your RGB to HDMI. It's a little bit confusing when you're looking at the project for RGB HDMI because there are so many different boards that have come up over the, over the years. This project is not brand new. And you'll see over on the side, there's a bill of materials for various digital boards, 3-bit, 6-bit, 6 and 8-bit, all the way up to the most current 12-bit. 
Now, if we take a look at these two boards here, this is the 12-bit board that I have on here, the one with the colored buttons. And this one is one I stuck on here because it actually works. But the one that has the problem is this one right here, which is a 6 slash 8-bit issue 3 board. Now, you'll notice they look very, very similar. The real difference is this one actually has some additional pins that have headers here. So notice there are more pins right there than there are there. That just exposes some additional inputs to the CPLD for more than six or eight bits, but actually up to 12 digital bits of information. The origins of this project were to output eight color graphics from the original BBC Micro, which had three bit digital output, which is just R, G, and B. Now, if you think about CGA, with, which supports 16 colors, it has RGB and an intensity bit. Or if you think about EGA, which supports 64 colors, that actually has six bits, right? So it's R, G, and B, and each one of those has an intensity bit for a total of 64 colors. But it turned out to support machines like the Atari ST or the Apple IIGS, as I showed with that adapter board, you need a full 12 bits of digital information to give you the 4096 colors that those machines support. For my purposes on the bench though, I'm always using this particular setup right here because all I'm using it with is EGA and CGA and monochrome, which really needs up to six bits. So this CPLD board is perfectly fine for me. All right, so back to the problem I'm having with this board. What is exactly going on with it and why isn't it working? Well, it turns out here when we take a look at the CGA pinout, RGB comes in on pins three, four, and five, and then H sync and V sync are eight and nine, and the intensity bit is six. And as I said, CGA works perfectly with this board, so there are no problems with any of those inputs on the CPLD. The problem appears when we take a look at the pinout for MDA and Hercules, which uses the same pinout. Take a look at this. Pin six is intensity, which is the same as on a CGA. Three, four, and five aren't even used at all. And pin seven is TTL video input. So the image is actually on pin seven and not on any of the other pins, which I know are working. Once I realized the pinout was different, because I guess I never really thought about that, and I realized that there must be a problem on the CPLD here on this board. Now, of course, because this is an open source project, all the schematics are freely available, and this is the schematic for this CPLD board. And this project uses a Xilinx XC9572XL CPLD. And when you look at the pinout here, all these GPIO pins are what are talking to the Raspberry Pi, and then there are all these R2, G2, these are the input pins on the CPLD. Now I traced out what is connected to pin seven, which is the video input on the MDA cable here, through the connector right to the CPLD, and sure enough, that signal is visible. I did it with an oscilloscope and I saw the monochrome video signal going to the CPLD, but it wasn't actually registering anything on the input. Now here's the data sheet for the particular CPLD that's being used on this project. And I think we can see the problem right here. Five volt tolerant IO pins, except five volts, 3.3 volts, and 2.5 volt signals. Well, the problem is whenever you have five volt tolerant pins, the chip itself probably runs at 3.3 volts or even 2.5 volts, and it's using diodes inside to kind of clamp the input voltage to prevent it from overloading those input buffers. While this clearly does work, and a lot of things like the floppy EMU for the Apple II and the Macintosh is a similar 3.3 volt part with five volt tolerant pins on it, it can cause the chip to get damaged a little bit more easily than if this were a true five volt part. It's just not as robust on those input pins as a real five volt part when you're sending potentially higher voltages into those pins. Now, because of that, back on the project here, there is actually a TTL buffer board that I probably should be using, which actually plugs into the underside right here, because this is where this thing was connected directly to. It plugs into there, and then it adds the appropriate buffer chip in line with the CPLD, just to prevent it from getting extraneous higher voltages that might damage those I.O. pins. So finally, to get the point of what this video is actually about, I wanna to try to repair this CPLD board so I can take this one off, this 12-bit one, and put it back on this RGB to HDMI in this bag here, which is my analog one, which has the analog board on it, which I used for composite video input when I need it. So for repairing this damaged board, I'm gonna to try to actually do a little bit of SMD desoldering and remove this chip and install a new one. I had reached out to Aaron from Retro Hack Shack and asked him about the fact that this board had gotten damaged, and I wondered if he had any other extra CPLDs lying around, and it turned out he did. So he dropped it in an envelope with a couple stickers here and sent it my way, so I'm gonna try to do a little repair. 
Before we do that though, let's test this to see if it's still not working. And that way, when it's repaired, I'll know because we'll get a working image. Okay, so the bench PC is set up here and I have a CGA slash monochrome card in here. This is a VTEC card. And I have the bad CPLD board reinstalled on the Raspberry Pi. And I have this connected up to the CGA card. And I have OBS configured here to capture the HDMI output from the RGB to HDMI and it's set for CGA. And you can see it looks absolutely perfect. All 16 colors are represented. All of those bits are working. So let's go into the menu here and let's switch this over to monochrome. Oh, it's funny, I actually have it set for EGA, but that seems to work with this card anyways. So let's switch over to, I think Hercules might be the right one. All right, well, you notice it's flashing right now, but you see some text and that's actually a giveaway that <laughs> there is a problem with that input bit. The flashing is coming from the RGB to HDMI. It's not synchronizing properly to the CGA video signal. So that's why it's flashing. But the fact that there's some text visible, it implies that that intensity bit, which it does work because it's the same pin that CGA uses, pin six, it's working. But the thing is when I reboot this thing, a normal PC doesn't really show anything with int intense text while it's booting. Well, it actually is right now, but that's because that's the, uh, the um, XT IDE and it has a little bit of bolded text. I'm gonna turn this off and there's a toggle switch on the video card here, which will switch it to monochrome mode. The computer might complain, but I think, Okay, I'm gonna push F1 here to try and get to the BIOS. Oh, look at that. We're not seeing any of the video except for the text that has the intensity bit set. But when I was trying to use the RGB to HDMI on an IBM PCXT, which is when I noticed this problem, it doesn't show any intense text when you first turn on the computer. In fact, you'd have to boot into DOS and then run a program to potentially see some intense text. So definitely there's a problem here on the CPLD. And like I said, I've already tested to make sure that the signal, the video signal is getting from this connector and it's making its way all the way through to the appropriate pin on the CPLD and it's just not working. So next step, swap the CPLD. All right, so for this little bit of SMD soldering, which I am extremely unskilled at, I'm gonna be using the Andon Star HDMI microscope, specifically because I can capture the video so everyone can see the work that I'm doing really close up. So here we have the board with the CPLD that's not working. I'm gonna to need to remove this. And I need to remember that the dot here goes towards this capacitor here, C1 down in the corner. And this is the CPLD right here that Aaron sent. And I guess this looks like it's the same part. Now I do know that it can be really difficult to find these chips, like due to the chip shortage or whatever. Not to mention, of course, you can order and get some fakes. I think things are getting a little bit easier to find. All right, so there is the new part right there. It looks good, of course, nothing is wrong with it. So now uh, I need to put this aside and get the old CPLD off the board. Now, if you take a look at this board, just look at how small these little capacitors are. Now, I think these were all hand soldered by the look of this. But if you're gonna remove chips like this off boards, you really need to use hot air and you need to use flux as well. I'm gonna be using this kind of flux right here. It's like a no clean flux. And I'm gonna be using a syringe to apply some of it around the IC. Now, again, like I mentioned, I really don't know what I'm doing here. So I might completely screw this up. All right, so here is a syringe. Whoops, I just squirted a whole bunch of flux. <laughs> okay, well, this is not the perfect syringe for this. Um, this kind of flux is very thin and it just went all over the bottom of the microscope there. This is the hot air rework thing that generates the hot air. I have it set for 350 degrees Celsius. I'm not gonna show the particular one I'm using because it's just an inexpensive one I've got, got off eBay. I can't recommend it being good or bad. If you just put hot air rework, there's a whole lot of them and they're very inexpensive. And here we go. So I'm just gonna move the hot air around here. I don't know if this was the right flux. I might have to switch to uh, rosin. I'm just gonna hold the chip down and I'm gonna heat this up. Seems like all the flux has kind of gone away. I don't think this particular no clean flux I'm using is the best because uh, it's too liquid. You need that thicker paste stuff. So actually, I'm gonna stop this for a sec and I'm gonna switch to rosin flux. Now this is the rosin flux that I use. It's uh, rosin comes from a tree, I think. It's very, very sticky. Um, I keep it in a little like squeeze bottle here just so I can apply it to an appropriate place. Thing is, it's messy and it's hard to clean up. 
So that's the negative thing about it. But uh, there we go. So lots of it around there. Look at that, it's bubbling. <laughs> that's how hot the, the chip is right now. But I'm just going to uh, start heating this again. Looks like it's starting to get molten a little bit, potentially. Yep, it definitely is. So you just gotta keep moving it around because you need to heat it up entirely, all the pins. Sorry, I'm so zoomed in, I can't zoom out any more than this. This is as much as the microscope can do. Okay, look at that. So I just grabbed it by one of its legs and off came the CPLD, just like that. Now, when we look at this board, there's a lot of flux on there and there's actually a good amount of solder already, but it might be a good idea for me to add some fresh solder on there. So I'm just heating up my soldering iron here to uh, 330 or so. And I'm just gonna add a little fresh solder onto the tip here. Okay, well that's obviously way too much. There we go. All right, so here's the new CPLD. Now one technique, of course, is you just, uh, you would just solder on one corner of the, the chip, like say that pin right there, and then you do one over here. And that allows you to kind of position it, because look how fiddly this is. It's like moving all around. All right, so it's looking pretty good, at least on the top left corner. So I'm gonna hold it down on that corner with one set of tweezers here, and I'm gonna use another set, and I'm gonna try to turn it just so slightly. Now, the problem is it's kind of riding up on top of those solder blobs that are there, but I, I think this is gonna be good enough right here. So I'm just gonna, oh, well, that sucked. <laughs> I was said I was gonna hold it down in the middle there, uh, and then I was gonna grab the hot air, uh, but that didn't work. This type of soldering is very much a skill, and you know, the more you practice it, the better you're gonna get at it. So I have really never done anything like this. This is really my first time. So that's why I'm sort of not doing such a great job here. Now, I'm sure there are people watching who have done this a million times and are probably like, you're doing it wrong. You could do this, that, or the other thing. But I'm just going to see what happens here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the chip here. I'm just going to hold it in the middle. I'm going to hit it with hot air, and I'm going to see if it kind of pulls it into position. Incidentally, I'm using these titanium tweezers that we're sending on a mail call episode. These are awesome because solder does not stick to these. So I'm just going to hold this down in the middle to try to minimize the moving. And look, it just keeps moving around. So let's just start heating the board. It's already heated up a little bit. A lot of times the capillary action of the solder can kind of pull the chip into position, but that may not happen with something as big as this. So I'm just gonna try to nudge it. I'm not even sure the solder has melted yet. It may not have. Oh, it moved a lot. You know, it would really help if I had this, uh, if I had the board actually attached down. Oh, look, it's kind of moving there. Do you see that? Let's go, come on. I know you want to. Oh no, <laughs> I made a mess and a disaster here. Oh no. This is not good, everyone. It's sort of soldered like this at an angle. No problem. We can get it off. We can fix this situation. I just have to uh, grab it here. Okay, there we go. Come on. Okay, this is a disaster. <laughs> an absolute disaster. I'm pulling this off right now. There it comes. All right, so first off, I need to see if I have bridged any of the solder joints. And no, it does not look like I have. I'm gonna try a new tactic. I'm gonna try to tap down or tack down some of the legs on this thing. 
All right, so I think it's pretty well aligned right now. It's not soldered down, and I'm gonna hold this down with the tweezers. I'm gonna try to just solder one pin over here on. Okay, like that. And then I'm gonna try to do the same over here on this bottom corner. Now, the fact is I only did one corner on the other side, so that means that you could still kind of move around the, uh, the chip, right? Okay. So now it's actually in place with two of the pins, which is good because that means that I can use hot air now to do the rest of it. Now, of course, there's a method called drag soldering where you just sort of go around the entire chip, but I'm just gonna see if I can do it this way. So I'm gonna hold it in the middle here so it doesn't move. And I'm gonna try to use hot air here to actually get the rest of the pins down. I mean, this is a, this might be a total disaster and I may end up ruining this board, right? Or this chip. Now I'm holding it because I don't want it to melt the pins that I've already soldered and all of a sudden move, right? That's why. So see there, it's melting those pins there and on the bottom row. But see, I'm not sure it's actually making a good contact there. Doesn't really look like it, does it? All right, so I may need to just do some drag soldering on this because this is, uh, I don't think this is really working. What you're seeing here, ladies and gentlemen, is not a tutorial. It's kind of like what not to do. Or if you're a newbie, this is what soldering ICs is like. <laughs> okay. Time to resort to the soldering iron. First thing is I'm gonna add more flux onto this thing again, right? You can never have too much, so to speak. Wow, it's hot. Yeah, it's a hot chip. I have some solder on the tip of the soldering iron here. And I just bridged a couple of pins together. Nice. We'll clean that up in a second. So after using the hot air, I'm not 100% sure if all the connections are good. So heating them up with a soldering iron after the fact just ensures that each of those connections is actually made. After tacking down those first two pins, I probably should just have gone ahead and done the soldering exactly like this and skipped the whole hot air part entirely. All right, to clean up those bridge solder joints, I'm gonna to try to use some of this MG Chemicals solder braid here. I think that might be okay. It's funny, I'm trying to see if there's a bridge here between those two pins. It almost looks like there is. First, let's try to get some solder on these pins here, which looks like I cleaned off. That little fillet there is annoying me on this, on this uh, capacitor. There we go. <laughs> okay, I have these probes here and the multimeter set to continuity mode. Let's just see if any of these things look bri are bridged together. That is not, which is good. How about these two pins? Nope. How about these two pins? They are fine, they are not. Those are good. How about that? And like, see this pin right here? Like I'm on the trace there. Let's just double check that actually has continuity on the chip. Doesn't appear to. Yeah, so that one is actually not connected at all. So the problem is I put so much of that rosin flux, which has got... <laughs> you gotta be kidding me! <laughs> oh, I'm like a disaster here. This is... I'm using the wrong tools. This is not right. Oh, let's just clean that up. There we go. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the worst. This is not a tutorial. Do not watch this for any kind of tutorial because uh, you're only gonna learn really bad techniques here with what I'm doing. I'm just trying to test continuity here on this uh, pin here. Okay, that now is connected. I really need to clean this up because all this flux is such a disastrous mess that, uh, yeah, look at that. Horrible, just horrible. Okay, 99% alcohol here. I have a little brush. Let's try to clean this off a little bit here. Now I'm gonna use a little piece of paper towel here. Try to kind of sop up the mess. 
All right, there we have it. After some cleaning, there's the board. Uh, it's ugly. It's really, really ugly. Are all those pins connected? I think so. It's hard to tell. I mean, I'll know better. Oh, look at that. After cleaning, these two pins are bridged right here. So let's try to clean those up. I highly recommend if you're gonna do any kind of soldering like this, you really should get yourself a microscope. And unless you have really good eyesight and good magnification, um, I'm not sure, well, I certainly with my regular eyes, I wouldn't be able to see that bridge. Maybe with those goggles I wear, I would, but the microscope makes it really easy to see. So let's just try to get rid of that bridge. There we go. I think I cleaned off a little bit too much solder though, so let's try to reapply a little bit. Okay, I think that might be okay now. So this board has sufficiently cooled off. It's back at room temperature. So it's time to see if I ruined it. Might have made it a lot worse than it was. Let's, let's see what happens. All righty, let's reconnect this once again. It's really the moment of truth here. I have no idea what's about to happen. Okay, CPLD recovery, all right. So it's saying that the CPLD is blank and it needs to be programmed. So it's a six or 12 bit RGB CPLD version 94. That's what I'm gonna be flashing on here. We're gonna push the button. It says it's blank. We're gonna hit identifying. Is it gonna work? Is it gonna work? I tortured it by heating it up and, <laughs> you know, multiple times. So I don't know. It says programming. Come on. How long does this take? Okay, it says successful rebooting. Doesn't mean it's gonna work because there might be damaged IO pins, things like that. All right, why is it green? That's weird, let's reset everything. Okay, I hit the reset button on there. Oh, um, yeah, I might've caused a problem here because it's, it's all green. Well, let's turn this on. All right, well, we're getting an image, so that's something. I guess, I mean, I don't know what else is wrong with this thing. So I'm perplexed at what's going on because I can see that the video input's now working. Why are the colors all weird? I'm gonna remove power from the Raspberry Pi entirely and let's power it back up again. Yeah, it's sort of, we see a flash of the color and then it goes right to this. I'm gonna change this to CGA 16 color mode. Let's see if that changes anything. And here we are back on the 16 color test pattern and it's, it's showing all the colors. It's just weirdly tinted and I don't really understand what could possibly be happening here. The weird thing is, is here in the palette menu, if I change it to invert, it's all inverted, but if I change it to monochrome, we're getting the pink and the green hues. It's confusing to me because I think the monochrome mode, which is what we're looking at here, would be the Raspberry Pi itself just filtering down the colors and displaying them in monochrome. And it wouldn't be happening in the CPLD itself. So if this were a problem with the CPLD, like the way it was connected, like I, I missed pins or something or things were shorted, then it wouldn't be showing this weird green and pink. Now I guess one way to test to see if it's the HDMI or not, is I'm just gonna switch to this RGB to HDMI. I'll just plug this one in and let's see if we're getting this pink and green color. Okay, we are. <laughs> so this is a problem with my capture setup. <laughs> Boy, you know, I think it was in a recent video where I talked about how it's really important to double check that there is no problem with the capture setup so you don't go down chasing the wrong thing on like thinking something else is wrong. And honestly, I could have easily thought that something was wrong with the CPLD here when I think I did this correctly. So I'm gonna stop the capture, I'm gonna reset OBS and my capture device and I'll be right back. And we're back and take a look at that. We have a perfect, CGA 16 color image. I did not break it. And all those crazy colors were due to my capture setup. Urgh. All right, so now the test. I'm gonna switch back to monochrome. I think we already know this is gonna work. I'll flip this toggle switch, hit the reset button. We know this is gonna work because we kind of saw it working already. And in fact, we're gonna go into the menu and we're gonna pick PC Hercules. And there it is, looking perfect. I think I have a copy of Windows 2.03, which is set up for Hercules right now. So let's run that. We should get Hercules graphics. Okay, well, the timing's not perfect with this particular profile and this card, but there it is. We have an image. It would not be working at all with this CPLD, the bad one, because we know it had a bad input pin. 
So that was my video on the RGB to HDMI and how to do some SMD soldering yourself, or rather how not to do SMC soldering yourself. Clearly I'm very inexperienced to SMD soldering. I, I do really struggle with it. I get there in the end, like I did with this one, but I do need to do a lot more practice so that I can get better at it. So I think I'm gonna end this video here. Uh, as I mentioned before in the video, I'm gonna put links in the description to buy the RGB to HDMI yourself, but I'm gonna also link to the GitHub repo so you can just make them yourself by downloading those Gerbers and having the PCBs made at your PCB maker of choice. I'm not gonna say any which one to use because not a sponsored video. Thanks Aaron for sending in the RGB to HDMI in the first place and of course for sending me this replacement CPLD. I'm sure a lot of people got laughs at my terrible technique at soldering, but hey, in the end it worked for me and that's what I really wanted to have uh, this, this RGB to HDMI working again. I'd love to hear comments about my terrible technique in the description or in the comment section below. So uh, go, go put comments down there. Uh, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and uh, thanks to my patrons, their names are showing up the side of the screen. I, I really thank them for their support, it's just amazing. And if you become a patron, there's, there's early access to videos. Um, I have also Patreon exclusive content that is for the higher tiers as well. So uh, yeah, there is that. And uh, the second channel's there. If you like uh, more CRTs and mail call type videos, it's all over there. So uh, I'd appreciate a subscribe on the second channel if you haven't already. And I guess that is gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.